Hello and welcome to the November slash December q and I apologise that it has been so late in coming along, but uh, things have been going on in the background, both figuratively and literally, um, that have kind of prevented me from doing last month's Q&A. So hopefully this one makes up for it, and I apologise for the glitchy green screen behind me. I'm still rejigging the lighting situation in my office slash room and OBS is having a bit of trouble taking out the green screen so there's probably going to be a bit of um, glitchiness around so I apologize about that but hopefully it's uh, not too distracting. Uh, anyway, Christmas has been and gone. Uh, New Year's is just around the corner. I've had a bit of time off and I hope everyone else has uh, enjoyed the holiday season as much as I have. Got a nice bit of relaxation in, ate a lot of food and drank a vast quantity of red wine. So very, very happy Rex. Um, so today, like usual, we'll go through the Patreon Q&A questions and then I will give just a quick channel update at the end. So let's get stuck into it. So the first question is we've got uh, so, Kevin asks, if you could go back in time to witness, but not change, one event in history, what would it be? So that's tough to answer, but one of the big ones for me would be watching the launch of Apollo 11, or in fact, any mission involving the Saturn V rocket. Um, probably one of my most favourite pieces of tech ever made. Um, I obviously wasn't around at the time to see those things launch, although it was nice to watch um, the, the SLS finally do its thing last month, or at the start of this month it might have been, which was uh, really exciting, but I, I would have loved to have gone and watch a Saturn V uh, rocket launch. That's definitely one of the... Um, one of the events I would go back and witness uh, more than more than anything else, and obviously not change anything. Uh, now, Andrew Mack asks, would you ever consider doing some episodes on bush planes? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, bush planes are definitely in the works. It's just a question of when, essentially. Um, I've actually got some books on uh, Australian bush planes, and I, I do know as well that they were used um, quite a bit in uh, remote regions of Canada and, and Alaska quite a bit as well. A lot, lot of short takeoff uh, monoplanes and biplanes that were used in the 20s, 30s and obviously through to, through to the modern day. So bush planes are definitely going to be something I eventually want to consider. And it's definitely on my now ever-expanding list of things I wish to cover. So it's more of a question you're going to be of... Um, not if, but when. But it's it's definitely on, on the list of topics I would like to cover in a special video. Possibly a mini-series. Um, now. So, Juan Echeverria, and I hope I pronounced that right, has asked, um, Have you considered doing an episode or episodes on the Spanish Civil War? Absolutely. Uh, that is a topic that I'm actively researching and collecting materials on, so I will probably actually split it into two videos that cover the aircraft used by each side in the Civil War, as there is an astounding variety of aircraft involved. There weren't just production models, there were one-off prototypes, experimental designs and so forth, and even some... Uh, field modified models that were only used during the war and then scrapped afterwards. So aircraft that were modified for a very specific task, used in the war, or even just cannibalized for parts and then disposed of at the end of it. Unfortunately, um, photographs of many of these interesting machines are quite hard to find, which is why the video is taking a long time to come together, but we will definitely be getting a couple of videos on this topic in the future. Uh, now, Bane asks, given the recent P-40 video, not so recent now, seeing this Q&A is quite, <laughs> quite late, um, what is the Rex pick for best bang for your buck fighter of World War II? I'm going to give two answers because I think it, it's fair to kind of have one for each side. Um, so for the Allied side, I would honestly say that the P-40 is the one, and a lot of this comes down to timing. There were a few other aircraft during the war that were built in large numbers and that served with multiple countries, you know, P-51 being a beautiful example. But a lot of these didn't start to enter service until late 1941 or 1942, at least in numbers that made them effective. 
The P-40 featured prominently in many of the early major theatres of the air war, and thus it often encountered the Axis air forces at their strongest. And so in terms of bang for your buck, in terms of what it was able to achieve with what you got out of it, I honestly think the P-40, out of, the, out of all the Allied World War II aircraft, did the best. I would also say, strangely, even though it was uh, getting obsolete pretty damn quickly, the um, the Hawker Hurricane's also a, a good a uh, good follow up especially for the first two years of the conflict but i think i think the p40 had more usefulness over the whole years of the war than the hurricane did so i think i think the p40 is the best bang for your buck and from the other side of the war i would say the bf109 without question it's the most produced fighter aircraft of the war it served throughout the entire length of the second world war and it fulfilled multiple roles, you know, being a fighter, fighter bomber, photo reconnaissance, etc. There, there really isn't anything else that comes even close to it. So, yeah, those are my two picks for best bang for your buck. Both, I would say, fairly predictable, but for very good reasons. Uh, now, Firestar asks, what is a favourite fighter aircraft of yours that was cancelled or passed over in favour of something else? I'm going to answer this from a purely aesthetic perspective, and I'm going to say the Curtis XP-55 um, and other designs. It looks like something straight out of a sci-fi novel, and I just completely love the way it looks. Um, I also have a bit of a soft spot for it, as it's one of my aircraft, my one of my favourite aircraft to fly in War Thunder, that and the Kyushu J-7W Shinden, which was a similar concept that that was explored by Japan and that will probably get its own feature video as well. Now, many people won't know this, but there was also a much lesser known Italian version of this concept as well, the SIA SS4. Now, if I can find enough data for all three designs, I would like to do a video in the future where I basically compare them to see which one, if any, had a significant advantage over its unknown competitor. As it stands, I don't have an ETA for that. I'm still trying to dig up information on the Italian one especially. But I think that's um, it's a video topic I think a lot of people will find inter interesting. And if I do this video and if, if people like it, I might do a similar one where I kind of, you know, compare three or four aircraft from similar manufacturers built for the same task and see how, at least in my opinion, I, I feel they, they, they stack up. Um, Obviously, I'd like to do this more probably for experimental and lesser-known designs rather than the big things like, you know, Spitfires, BF-109s, Fokker Wolves, that kind of stuff. But if, if that's interesting and if people want to have videos on that as well, I'll definitely consider doing it. Now, Green Sea Ships asks, There was a sense in the US that war was coming with Japan long before Pearl Harbor. But what about Australia? Was the RAAF ever adequately prepared to counter the Japanese offensive in the early part of World War II? Or did Australia farm out too much talent to the Crown to defend its own interests when Japan came calling, and therefore forced to rely on the US and Royal Navies? This is a fairly complex topic, so I'll try and keep the answer as brief as I can. Um, basically, the Royal Australian Air Force was not prepared at all. They were not prepared at all when war broke out with Japan. They were certainly aware that a potential war in the Pacific was looming, particularly by late 1940 and early to mid-1941, when US-Japanese tensions were mounting. But as there was not currently a war in the Pacific, priority was of course given to the war in Europe, i.e. defending the heart of the British Empire. Because of this, the Royal Australian Air Force only had just over 370 aircraft in the Pacific by the time of Pearl Harbor itself. Most of these were obsolete or training aircraft, and almost all of their experienced air officers were overseas, with a lot of their fighter squadrons being stationed in Africa. Then, the establishment of the Commonwealth Air Training Plan, known as the Empire Air Training Scheme in Australia, had further complicated things as well. In a nutshell, this was a scheme for the dominions of the Empire to provide a large number of aircrew in order to keep the RAF sufficiently manned and supplied. Now, the plan for Australia was to train 50,000 aircrew for the RAF over a period of three years. Of course, 
after the war broke out with Japan, things changed dramatically, but it did mean that up until that point, a significant portion of the potential manpower was being funneled off to other parts of the world, which basically leads to a perfect storm of Australia being both under-equipped and undermanned at the start of 1942. There's actually a pretty good book I can recommend on the subject. Uh, it's called A Last Call of Empire, Australian Air Crew, Britain and the Empire Air Training Scheme. Now, it was written by John McCarthy and was published by the Australian War Memorial, and it's pretty much the single best book on the subject from the Australian perspective. However, copies of it are quite hard to find. And of course, in a theme that I am now going to replicate for most of my Q&As, I am leaving the most complex question for last. Now, Robert Henry Ilston asks, How effective would the B-29s have been over East Europe or the Soviet Union against Soviet air defences had Operation Unthinkable come to pass in late 1945-1946? Operation Unthinkable is, of course, the potential slash hypothetically planned war between the Allies and the Soviet Union. Now, on the whole, the effectiveness of the B-29 would have probably been mixed, and this is assuming they were not being used to drop nuclear bombs on the Soviet Union, but rather sticking with conventional explosives and incendiaries. If production of the aircraft had carried on at its highest level, they would have certainly been on hand in strength to cause the Soviet Union a considerable headache, but their true effectiveness is honestly just quite difficult to predict. To begin with, Operation Unthinkable was planned for mid to late 1945, when the British expected the bulk of the American forces to be taken up with the invasion of the Japanese mainland and this meant that the likelihood of B-29s being available for the first few months of the hypothetical war was slim. But putting that aside, there are other things to bear in mind as well. The B-29s were effective over the Japanese home islands for a few reasons, and disclaimer, this is me massively oversimplifying things, just to keep the answer as short as possible. Their target was concentrated on a small landmass, meaning that most bombers were focused in a relatively small area of the Pacific theatre. The opposing air force had no advantage in manpower, airframe production, nor the means to maintain either in any real capacity by mid-1945, and because of this, the US air bases fielding the B-29 could never really be threatened. In the event of a war with the Soviet Union, the B-29's position would of course be altered. Not only was their target much, much bigger in terms of just pure landmass, with its industry decentralised across multiple cities, but the VVS, the Soviet Air Force, was not an opponent to be taken lightly. In the West alone, it had some 14,500 aircraft, of which 9,300-ish were fighters and ground attackers. Admittedly, Soviet radar systems were not on par with those used by other Allied forces, but they still had some, and these would still play a part in hampering the effectiveness of B-29s when combined with vast swarms of intercepting fighters. Basically, I can't say with any certainty how effective the B-29s would be. Some people seem to think that they would decimate Soviet cities and infrastructure much like what had happened elsewhere, whereas others think that the weight of numbers of the Soviet Air Force, and their vast reserves, would be more than enough to tip the scale. All I can say with some certainty is it would have been very, very messy, and they probably would have sustained quite heavy casualties even if they were effective at a large scale. And, of course, after the dropping of the atomic bomb, and various other considerations along the lines of the fact that the Russians outnumbered the Allies on the ground in Europe over a scale of 2 to 1, Operation Unthinkable was very quietly put to one side for good, thankfully. Um, so that's the Q&A stuff out of the way. It's um, a fairly short one today, just owing to time constraints for me, and also I didn't collect a lot of questions because the November Q&A thing didn't really happen. I'm just going to go over a couple of real quick updates here. Um, so update number one, for the middle of January, I'm basically not going to be here. Um, hopefully there's going to be some videos still going up. Um, 
but I'm not going to be around, uh, so that's probably going to be from around, say, the, the 5th until the 20th-ish of January, give or take. Um, hopefully all the videos still go up on, on schedule and on planned, but um, if there are going to be any delays, I will post on Patreon, and I will post, of course, on the YouTube community tab as well. Um, nothing major, just taking some personal time off with my partner, and I also have a minor medical procedure, which is going to have me out of action for a couple of days as well. Um, next update after that, there should be no interruption to video schedules, fingers crossed, until the middle of the year when I'm away to the UK for a couple of weeks, um, well, three-ish weeks from the end of June through to early July. Providing all goes well, I will be attending the International Air Tattoo, so I'm very much looking forward to that because I've actually never been to the Air Tattoo before, and it is one of my sort of aviation aircraft sort of bucket list things to attend, so very much looking forward to that. Um, and the big news, additionally, hopefully, I will actually be in a full house rather than a room by the end of this year, which means I'll actually have an office and a library and a proper studio to use, which means I won't need to start using a shitty green screen to block out the atrocious mess that is behind this invisible barrier. There's books, there's boxes, there's um, tarantula enclosures. <laughs> I have pet tarantulas. Um, it, it's just, it, it, it's a nightmare. You don't want to see what is behind this right now. So hopefully by the end of this year, um, I'll be in a in a full place with a proper room for re like doing proper recordings and stuff, and that's gonna make a big difference to the quality of the videos as well because I can actually start scanning documents and other things on mass. Because at the moment I don't really have a room for a permanent scanner setup. I'm having to sort of hodgepodge things around, and that really affects uh, what videos I can do because researching from like use doing hard hard book research is fine, like something physically printed, but if I can also scan sections of the books and just reference that on the computer, it's just much easier than having editing a video and doing script work with like a giant hardback book on my lap. It's a pain in the back. Pain in the ass, I should say. But anyway, I digress. Um, hopefully you should have my own full office by the end of this year. Now that will obviously um, mean a temporary halt in channel uploads, maybe for like a month or two whilst I move, because I am also moving to a different city when that happens. I'm moving about six or seven hundred kilometers further north towards the tropics. So that'll be a, a massive undertaking, but hopefully there will be a lot of notice to give everyone on the channel and on the Patreon of when that happens. And um, yeah, that basically wraps up today's uh, Q&A for December, and that actually wraps up uh, 2022 as a whole for the channel. Um, yeah, it's been a big year. I wasn't expecting the channel to blow up in the way it did, considering uh, I've got this thing already after a year, which is just absolutely insane. I, I cannot uh, explain in words how grateful I am for everyone for their support of this channel and all of the wonderful comments and suggestions. I've taken a lot of feedback on board. Hopefully things are improving as things go, but just having a hundred thousand people listen to me talk about planes every week is the dream. It is literally my dream job, so hopefully I can keep doing it for a very, very, very long time. But uh, Roll on 2023, and hopefully I can actually get another Q&A done in January when I'm back. I, I'd like to make it uh, a monthly thing rather than every second month, which is kind of what it's becoming at the moment. So um, feel free to leave any questions down in the FAQ comment below. I do read through those, and if there are any ones that are sort of um, warranting of a fairly decent answer, like more than a paragraph long, I'll try and um, bug them into the next Q&A along with the Patreon questions. But until then, thank you all so much for watching, have a very happy new year, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.